We respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which this event is taking place. We would also like to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Hello, welcome and thank you for joining us today for this online webinar, Familien Forschung, Researching Your German Family History. This webinar is a collaboration between National Archives of Australia and State Library of Queensland. It will uncover valuable resources offered by each organisation to assist Queenslanders to find their German ancestors. Today's presenters are Eve Terry, Senior Archival Officer from National Archives of Australia, and Eileen Duane, Librarian of State Library of Queensland. A little housekeeping before we get started. This webinar will be recorded and available for viewing on our website at a future date. If you have any questions during the session, please enter them via the Q&A or chat function. Questions will be answered at the end of each presenter's talk. Good morning and welcome to Familien Forschung, researching your German family history at the National Archives. The National Archives collection mainly includes Australian government records from Federation in 1901 to now. We hold immigration records, war service and defence records, records relating to Prime Ministers, Royal Commissions and Cabinet decisions, just to name a few. We also have some 19th century records that were transferred to the Commonwealth at Federation. Luckily for those interested in German family history, there is a sizeable amount of content to get your hands on, and that's because of the information that the government collected and recorded about German migration, from an individual's suitability to come to Australia, their journey here, and their life in their new home. Not to mention the information that was recorded at a policy level and records that tell us about the impact of migration on our society as a whole. In preparation for this talk, I was interested to learn that Familien Forschung, translated literally, means family research in German. Familien meaning family and Forschung meaning research. What I'll be showing you today is really just a snapshot of what we hold so we can dip our toes in, so to speak. The earliest Germans to land in Australia would be the two German crew members and one German scientist that Captain James Cook had with him on board the ship Adventure in 1770, when he claimed Australia for Great Britain. These two gentlemen pictured, Johann Reinhold Forster and his son Georg, were naturalists who accompanied Captain Cook on his second voyage from 1772 to 1775. There were also Germans who were part of the first fleet in 1788. Rather than travelling overseas to explore uncolonised lands, the Germans of the 19th century ventured overseas in search of a new life. But what were the factors influencing this exodus? This time period was chaotic for a large portion of Europe, but for Germany, there were four main factors. Firstly, religious persecution. The German state governments saw the development of new religious groups as possible political threats, as some religious orders opposed war and the payment of taxes. So religious sects like the Mennonites, Baptists, German Quakers and Old Lutherans left for other lands to seek freedom of worship. Secondly, economic factors. The end of the Napoleonic Wars saw the collapse of the wartime markets and the mass return of soldiers to their farming region homes, causing a shortage of viable land and work, which increased the cost of basic items and caused wages to stagnate. Thirdly, political reasons. The many failed revolutions in Germany, Prussia had developed into a war machine with compulsory military service for all males and able men between the ages of 17 and 45 eligible to be drafted. And lastly, social reasons. The country had changed from a farming society to an industrial nation. Many farmers who own land became wage laborers and independent tradesmen and craftsmen became factory workers. Emigration may have seemed a good option to start afresh and work for oneself again. This drawing is a depiction of Bremerhaven in 1870, 
More than 7 million emigrants departed Europe from the port of Bremerhaven between the years 1830 and 1974. 3.7 million of them were Germans. Bremen was the European emigrants port of choice up until 1850. It was a busily and bustling transport route and this caused some problems for the city. Many immigrants were left stranded and had to beg for food or money for passage after falling victim to unscrupulous ships agents who enticed them to Bremen with a promise to ship them to America and provide them with a plot of land. By the year 1900, Hamburg was Germany's most significant immigration port. The Hamburg American Parcel Joint Stock Company was founded in Hamburg in 1847, which brought a number of new ships into service. The image on the right is a picture of the inside of Hamburg's emigration hall, where processing took place. Known as Germany's gateway to the world, it is the country's largest seaport by volume. After its separation from New South Wales, Queensland's assisted passage schemes encouraged many Germans and Scandinavians to land in Queensland ports rather than the southern colonies. The first Queensland government of 1859 set up an immigration committee and sent Johann Christian Häusler, a successful German businessman in Brisbane, to Germany to recruit immigrants for Queensland. Häusler was born in 1820 near Frankfurt and arrived in Brisbane in 1854. Hoysler was able to offer immigrants attractive deals and free passage to Australia was only the beginning. Large pastoral holdings were being established, which included a shepherding position for two to three years with an established wage. This enabled many immigrants to work, learn the country and then set themselves up with their own small property. In 1890, Hoysler became German Consul for Queensland and Director of the Land Bank of Queensland. In 1897, he was the Commissioner for Queensland in Holland. He died in 1907 and is buried in Wong Cemetery. This map shows us Deutsche Siedlungen, or German settlements in Queensland, and shows the extent of the massive German influx into southern Queensland in the mid to late 1800s and until the First World War, when German immigration came to a halt. It's interesting to see the many place names in Queensland that are or once were German in origin, such as Bismarck, now McLagan, and Habsburg, now Cowby. One example of a German settlement is the area on the Logan River, now known as Bethania. Bethania was identified as German for about 100 years. Bethania is an anglicization of the name taken by the Lutheran congregation, Bethanian, which is the German form of the biblical Bethany. Around 17,360 Germans migrated to Queensland between the years 1861 and 1879, although there was a brief halt between 1866 and 1869. By 1891, 8,700 males and 6,210 females of German birth resided in the state. By 1900, Germans were the fourth largest ethnic group in Australia after the English, Irish and Scots in that order. Overall, South Australia and then Queensland had the largest intake of German-speaking migrants. Still today, Queensland and South Australia have a higher percentage of German descendants than any other state. I've included here a list of examples of the kinds of files held by the National Archives that are relevant for German family research. This is just a selection, a starting point really. We hold passenger lists for numerous ports, alien registration documents, naturalization and immigration case files, internment records and migrant selection documents. And we'll be looking at examples of these today. As you can see from these date ranges, the vast majority of these records are post-Federation from the 20th century onwards. Other records such as migrant center records, ships voyage files and defense service records may include information that shed light on a migrant's journey to and life in Australia. If you visit our website, naa.gov.au, you will find many learning resources relating to immigration and citizenship records. You may wish to visit these as your first port of call, pardon the pun. Select Explore the Collection at the top of our home page and select Immigration and Citizenship. Here you'll find details about our immigration holdings, 
including some background information or research guides on the topics in question. The link to migrant accommodation camps, for example, lists all of the migrant centres that operated around the country in a brief explanation of the purpose the camp served. Aside from the categories of passenger records, naturalisation and alien registration, this page provides information on the Immigration Restriction Act 1901, child migration and wartime internment. So an excellent way to place the records you find in our collection into their historical context. Passenger lists and passenger cards are a valuable source of information as they provide evidence of a person's arrival into Australia. The Brisbane office holds passenger lists from 1852 up to 1982, and these include arrival by ship and air. Later dates can be found in our Canberra office. Lists that predate the archives holdings may be held by the Queensland State Archives and the State Library of Queensland. Brisbane holds inwards and outwards ships passenger lists for all Queensland ports from 1852 to 1964. The image on the right here is an earliest passenger list we have for Brisbane, Moreton Bay, the Argyle, arriving on the 4th of August, 1852. For aircraft passengers, the archives holds passenger cards from 1934 and up to the late 1980s in Canberra, including this 1964 arrival card for Richard Starkey or Ringo Starr from the Beatles. This is an example of an inward passenger list from 1870. The handwriting is not the easiest to read, but we can see that the ship is the Humboldt Meyer, arriving at the port of Brisbane on the 8th of November 19, or 1870 rather, from Hamburg. This first page lists the names of the crew. And this is an example of the list of passengers. Compare that passenger list to this one from 1953. As time goes by and technology improves, passenger lists become much easier to read. These German passengers arrived via the Skalbrin in November 1953. So how do we go about finding a relevant passenger list? To access our records database from our website, simply select the Explore the Collection tab at the top and then click on Record Search or click on the Go to Record Search blue link at the bottom of the screen. Here you can see our basic and advanced search tabs, as well as name search, photo search and passenger arrivals. Selecting the passenger arrivals tab will lead you to the passenger arrivals index for ships arriving into Australia between 1898 and 1972. Most of our passenger records are arranged by the name of the ship, the date of departure and the port of arrival or departure. And unless you know these details, your search could be very time consuming as you can't simply type a person's name into record search and come up with the corresponding passenger list. If you're lucky, a record that includes your person's name in the title may also have the arrival details in the title in addition to their name. But if not, this index is an easy tool that's been designed to help you find the details you need. The index also includes aircraft arrivals from the 1940s onwards. The index was originally based on our passenger list for ships arriving into Fremantle. However, it now includes other ports as well. Most passenger vessels from Europe made Fremantle their first port. Passenger lists for Fremantle, including all passengers on board, including people disembarking in other Australian ports. So they're a rich resource for family historians. I'll use the name of Frederick Zachen as an example. There are search fields for family name and given name, ship or aircraft name, and year or port of arrival and embarkation. For this index, I prefer to enter just a family name, as given names of migrants are often anglicised. For example, Heinrich often becomes Henry. I have entered Zachen in the family name field, but I haven't entered his given name of Frederick, because he also could have gone by the name Friedrich, and there could be a number of alternative ways of spelling these names. I can enter a ship name if I know it, or I can click the blue rectangle to the right, which will show me all the ships in the index in alphabetical order. This certainly helps with difficult ship names. I would only enter dates of arrival if you're searching for a common name and need to narrow down your search. Not all passenger index entries include given names, 
exports of embarkation and disembarkation. So this is why it can be best to keep your search broad, at least initially. The first two results we get are Frederick Zachen and his wife, who we can see traveled on the Orsova and arrived in Brisbane on the 17th of March, 1936. You may notice that the given name is listed as simply F. So it's a good thing that I didn't enter our passenger's first name. If I had, it wouldn't have returned this search result. Only entering a surname means you also get the benefit of potentially seeing who your passenger traveled with or if other members of the same family came to Australia. Frederick traveled with his wife, Lydia. We can see her name below his with the identical arrival details. You can see on the right, the links to the digital copy of the passenger list and clicking on the stack of papers will take you straight to the page that contains your passenger's name. This is the screen you're taken to when you click on the digital copy link. And here are Frederick and Lydia's names on the bottom of the last page of this Orsova passenger list. Our passenger arrival index is just one of many search tools we offer. Our basic search feature in Record Search is where family historians usually start their search for records using a keyword search. The database has approximately 8 million items listed. And while this isn't the entire collection, we add items at a rate of several hundred thousand a year. The best keyword searches are simple and represent the main concepts of your research subject. Record search will then search for all the record titles that use the exact terms you entered into the search box. Examples of keywords may include a person's name to find an immigration record, a service number to locate a war service record, or the name of a ship for passenger arrivals. You can also view and order digital copies of selected records here in record search. Record search also has an advanced search option. This is useful when you want to search a record that belongs to a specific group of records called a series. To do this, first click the advanced search tab at the bottom of the screen, sorry, the top of the screen, and then the items box at the base of the pyramid. This will open the following search screen. Series J715 is our main series of ships passenger arrivals into Brisbane dating from 1852 to 1964. So let's find the passenger list for Frederick and Lydia Zachen's arrival using advanced search. As you can see here, you need to enter J715 into the series number field and then enter the date or date range of the ship's arrival. I've entered the year 1936, which I know is the year of arrival, thanks to the passenger arrival index. This will provide me with all of the passenger lists for that year, as well as some months on either side of that year. There are only two results. The first result contains passenger lists from the 2nd of June, 1935 to the 31st of October, 1936 while the second result contains lists from the 1st of November, 1936 to the 28th of February, 1938. As the Zakins arrived in March, 1936, I would select the first result. And here are the original passenger lists. Passenger lists are great because they also tell us the passenger's age, if they're traveling with children or other family members, their occupation in their country of origin and their intended residence in Australia. Frederick was a merchant in Germany and he was 26 when he arrived in Australia with his 20 year old wife. Our immigration and citizenship records can easily be searched using name search. Click the name search tab in record search and select the immigration and naturalization records category from the drop down menu. A date range can be entered here, which helps if the name is a common one. For this example, I've used the name Hans Schmidt. I've seen Schmidt spelled a variety of different ways, without the D, without the C, with a double T. So beware. The wildcard searching tips on the screen can be quite useful in these scenarios, and these can be used in all areas of record search. In the case of married couples, the wife is often included in the husband's file as a dependent alongside any children. And if she's listed as Mrs. Hans Schmidt rather than by her first name, she won't be as easy to find. Clicking on the series number link will tell you what kind of record this is 
and which government agency created it. In this case, it's a migrant selection document created by the Migrant Reception and Training Centre, Bonagilla. This is one of those lucky times where the arrival details for Hans Schmidt and his family are included in the title of this file. They came out on the Scalbrun in 1957. To view the digital record, click View Digital Copy or the stack of papers. You can also download the record as a PDF. So here we have some pages from the Schmidt family's migrant selection file. Many intending migrants applied for assisted passage to Australia, and these applications and the associated documents are known as migrant selection documents. Our office in Canberra has large holdings of these. Personal information on individual migrants found in these documents usually include the subject's name, nationality, date and place of birth, spouse and names of children, if any, and a trade, occupation or training summary. Many include passport size photographs. On some documents, names of next of kin or parents are included. Other information can relate to travel, accommodation and medical details. From this page alone, we learn that Hans was born in Island Bog in 1929, married Hannah Law in 1950, and he and his young family were approved for migration to Australia in 1956. Listed as Hans' dependents are his wife, his sons, Reinhard, born in 1950, and Heinz Jürgen, born in 1955. Quite often, we use other immigration records to assist us in narrowing down dates of arrival and other useful information. One of our largest and most varied series of records spanning a broad period of time are the immigration case files from the Queensland series J25. Immigration case files were created for individuals or families entering Australia seeking permanent or temporary residence. J25 case files date from 1908 and consist of records that show the migrant has either been granted permanent residence, naturalisation or citizenship. They contain documents such as official and individual correspondence, medical reports, passenger arrival details, alien registration forms, naturalisation documentation, police reports and security assessments. Most of our J25 case files are listed on record search and can be found easily by searching for the person's name. However, there are some instances where a case file may still be in the custody of the Department of Home Affairs. In these cases, our reference officers can contact the agency and arrange for access through the open office. Here's an example of a J25 case file for Ermgard Kreiter, who migrated to Australia in 1961. This file has 28 pages, so this is just a small selection of some of the documents it contains. But here's what we can learn about Ermgart from them. Ermgart was born in Asterberg, Germany, on the 16th of May 1934. The document in the right-hand corner appears to be a declaration from the local police station in her hometown to say that Ermgart did not have a criminal record. She travelled to Australia on the Aurelia and disembarked in Melbourne, where she resided for the next five years. In 1967, Ermgart moved to Annerley here in Brisbane and applied for naturalisation as an Australian citizen. On Australia Day 1968, she was naturalised and signed an oath of allegiance, also signed by Clem Jones, the Lord Mayor at the time. Speaking of naturalisation, we hold Commonwealth naturalisation and citizenship records from 1904 onwards. These are naturalisation certificates up to 1962 and naturalisation case files. This image is from a naturalisation case file for George Bauer, a German miner living at Claremont. He was naturalised in 1907. Case files give more detail than certificates. They include the citizenship application, the oath of allegiance and other documents. Our reference officers have access to the ICSE index which is an index for all migrants who are naturalised and can be used to check if there may be a case file for that person in the first place. So naturalisation has been defined as the admission of aliens to the position and rights of citizenship, allowing them to enjoy the privileges of native born subjects. But after the outbreak of World War I, 
we can see the level of protection that naturalization actually provided a citizen. That is to say, not much. Before the Great War, German communities were accepted and admired as prosperous, industrious and dutiful settlers. The outbreak of war changed that perception almost overnight. Many Australians of British descent believe that Australians with German origins would immediately give their full support to the German Empire. They thought that German Australians were spies. Many of them changed their names to sound more British. People refused to buy anything German, even German pianos. German street names and place names were also changed. The Federal Parliament, following Britain's lead, passed the War Precautions Act 1914. This document from our collection is a memorandum that explains the purpose and scope of the War Precautions Bill. The Act restricted the freedom of groups and individuals thought to be a threat, including those who were critical of our involvement in the war. But the most restricted group were what were classed as enemy aliens. In, eyes of the government, in the eyes of the government, Germans who had been granted British citizenship were now considered German citizens. And in early 1915, the meaning of enemy aliens was actually changed to include naturalized migrants and even Australian born people whose fathers or grandfathers had been born in Germany or Austria. So within weeks of the declaration of World War I, all German subjects and all other aliens had to be registered and report all changes of name, address, job or marital status to the local police. Alien registration forms may include this information as well as the mode and date of arrival in Australia, date and place of birth and physical description or photograph. Alien registration was required during both world wars and all the way up to 1971. So the National Archives has a large collection of alien registration forms. This application for alien registration was for a Francis August Dunker living at Dunwich Benevolent Asylum, who was naturalized and had been living in Australia for 43 years. The form reads, Dunker states he was naturalized at the Water Police Court, Sydney, between the years 1871 and 1874. Can't remember the exact date. He was afterwards informed that his records were destroyed in the Garden Palace fire. His own certificate had been destroyed by insects. The government continued to introduce more stringent regulations, which involved preventing German enemy aliens from voting, using their German language, as well as buying and selling property. German and Lutheran schools closed down and the German language was excluded from the school curriculum. Evidence was often passed onto the government by a suspicious population and also sourced from its postal censorship activities. This accusation from a Brisbane lady who reported that the German cabinet maker's premises next door in Given Terrace, Paddington, was being used as an assembly point for Germans and that parts of field guns were being brought to the house in night carts and hidden in sawdust in the backyard. These reports can be found in BP 230-12, military district and informants letters detailing suspected German disloyalists. Australia interned almost 7,000 people during World War I, of whom about 4,500 were enemy aliens and British nationals of German ancestry already living in Australia. The rest were sailors from German Navy and merchant ships who were arrested while in Australian ports when war broke out, or German citizens living in British territories in Southeast Asia who were transported to Australia at the request of the British government. So some internees were temporary visitors trapped here at the outbreak of the war. Internees were accommodated in camps around Australia, often in remote locations. The camps were administered by the army and run along military lines. They were often referred to as concentration camps. At the end of each war, the internment camps were closed down. The National Archives holds records about these camps, their development and administration, as well as about the government policy that established them. Our collection also includes records about the people who spent the war years in internment, but individuals mentioned in the files are not often named in the file titles, so won't likely be identified by a name search. 
It was also not uncommon for internees to be moved from one camp to another, even to another state, so records may be located in various offices of the archives. We hold registers of internees and prisoners of war in most states relating to these camps. For World War I internees, references in registers, nominal roles or other lists may be all that are available. For World War II internees, there is a little more, as there are case files and dossiers on individuals. The Holsworthy camp at Liverpool in Western Sydney was the largest and longest running internment camp. Over the period of its operation covering both world wars, it housed up to 6,000 men, both internees and prisoners of war. The archives holds records for this internment camp for World War I, including a series of identification photographs of the internees. The Inogwe internment camp was located next to an existing army camp. It housed nearly 140 internees, including the non-military officers and crew of civilian German ships docked in Brisbane after the outbreak of war. We hold records about the Inogwe camp during World War II, but not so much World War I. This file relates to prisoners who escaped from Inogwe camp on the 13th of May, 1915. This letter, sent to the Secretary of the Department of Defence in October 1918, informs him that Albert Schick, who escaped all those years ago, had still not been recaptured. As the definition of enemy aliens widened, it was realised that it wouldn't be possible to intern every German Australian. This was the largest European migrant group in Australia, with over 30,000 here at the time. So the government pursued a policy of selective internment, targeting leaders of the German Australian community, German consuls, pastors of the Lutheran church and well-known businessmen. One of these was Dr. Eigen Hirschfeld, who arrived in Brisbane in 1890, age 24. He became a naturalized British subject in 1893 and married an Australian-born woman named Annie Sadler in 1897. Prior to World War I, he was senior honorary physician at both the Brisbane Hospital and the Marta Public Hospital, and a member of the Medical Board of Queensland. While overseas, he investigated tuberculosis and cancer hospitals for the government. In 1906, he was appointed Imperial German Consul for Queensland and founded a Society for the Propagation of German Language and Culture and in 1914 was a member of the Legislative Council for Queensland. Hirschfeld lived and practised quietly through 1915, but in February 1916, he was interned at Inogra and transferred a week later to the Liverpool camp in New South Wales. He was aged 50. This document is a warrant for Hirschfeld to be detained in military custody for the duration of the war. This letter was written by Hirschfeld in July 1917, after being interned for over a year. I speak now on behalf of the Germans who came to Queensland, where I have lived for over 26 years. We are not intruders. We were induced to come out to Queensland. This state had sent out immigration agents to Germany. Pamphlets were issued by the Queensland government, setting forth the attractive conditions under which the Germans could settle. The word that you have given was made into a bond when we became naturalised. This is a letter from Dr. Hirschfeld's father-in-law to his daughter, written in October 1917. Keep well, my dear, and don't be downhearted. The war will soon be over, and the bigger licking the Germans get, the better it will be for those who remain here. And then you will have him back. In the meantime, keep your spirits up and keep your own counsel. But almost two years later, months after the war ended on the 27th of May, 1919, a letter was sent to Mrs. Hirschfeld from the intelligence section with regards to the possible deportation of her husband after almost 30 years living in Australia. On the 6th of November, 1919, Hirschfeld was released from the camp on parole with instructions to report every Monday to the Criminal Investigation Branch in Brisbane. 
Hirschfeld was deported after an investigation in 1920 and was finally permitted to return to Australia in 1927. Before and during World War II, Hirschfeld was again subjected to Commonwealth government surveillance. By this time, he was in his 70s. He has his own Queensland investigation case file, which is 126 pages long and includes many letters from informants, including from staff nurses he had employed. Hirschfeld died in 1946 at the age of 80. In World War II, 7,251 Germans were interned, 2,000 were Australian Germans, and 800 were naturalised British subjects. Initially, an enemy alien could only be interned if there was a reasonable case with evidence. For example, if he were a member of the Nazi or fascist movement. If the enemy alien was a refugee, he could prove his case and explain how he had helped the Australian cause more than the enemies. These documents are from a record in series BP242-1, Correspondence Files Relating to National Security. They are lists of aliens in various regions of Queensland, Rockhampton, the Central Highlands and the Gladstone region. The notes on each individual make for interesting reading. One gentleman being investigated was 69 years old at the time, and while the investigator believes that his sympathy is with Germany, his discreet inquiries into the matter led him to believe that the gentleman was not likely to render any assistance to Germany in wartime. Ah, but how quickly things change. By the end of World War II, it was time for Australia to replenish. At this point, our population was only 7 million and birth rates were at an all-time low. Immigration largely ceased during the war, and by the end of it, almost a million Australians were serving in the armed forces. We either fill this country or we lose it, was the view of Arthur Caldwell, Australia's first minister for immigration, between 1945 and 1949. Caldwell saw migrants as providing the necessary increase in the workforce to boost post-war reconstruction. Australia needed a VRL population, he said. He enthused about the fine types he saw among those in German refugee camps, displaced by the war and the Nazi regime. They came from a variety of occupations. He said they represent an ideal source of migrants who will fit smoothly into our way of life and who will help to meet Australia's labour shortages. They had to be prepared to serve what became two-year contracts in industries and occupations vital to the development of Australia. And Corwell declared, they cannot expect to walk in here and pick and choose the jobs that they like. As one official put it, they were coming to fill the gaps in the Australian economy. This is the first page of the incoming passenger list for the ship General Stuart Heinzelman, the first ship to arrive in Australia with displaced persons. It left Bremerhaven on the 30th of October, 1947, and arrived at Fremantle on the 28th of November, 1947. The Snowy Hydroelectric Scheme began on the 17th of October, 1949. These are German carpenters at Adaminibi, a small town near the Snowy Mountains. On the far left is Senator Bill Spooner, the Minister for National Development at the time. Two thirds of those who worked on the scheme between 1949 and 1974 were born overseas. Immigration officers initially targeted European men with engineering and construction skills for employment on the scheme, mainly Germans and Norwegians. Other Germans who worked on the Snowy Hydro were assisted migrants or displaced persons. Rudolf Spork was a displaced person, as we can see from his incoming passenger card from 1951 from his alien registration record in BP25-1. Rudolf was born in Allenstein, Germany, and his nationality is stateless. Allenstein was a government region of East Prussia. The region was dissolved following World War II when East Prussia was partitioned between the Republic of Poland and the Soviet Union, and the remaining German population of the province was expelled. 29-year-old Lauter Kincher migrated in 1953 as a single man. In 1956, he returned to see his family and within a year, he was married and back in Australia with his wife and son Ronald 11 months. 
Lothar, an electrical mechanic, was emphatic that he would not settle again in Germany. He said, I've compared living conditions in both and Australia is the place for me. Generally, wages are much higher here. 84% of German migrants coming to Australia between 1954 and 1961 travelled under an assisted scheme. Here we have Mr and Mrs Hans George Mint on arrival in July 1956 with their three children aboard the Fair Sea. The caption reads, they moved quickly through customs and boarded the train, which was to take them along with the other families to the Bonagilla Reception Centre. The same evening, they were relaxing in the comfortable surroundings of the centre. Before disembarkation, Mr and Mrs Mint with their children have a look at Melbourne and their new homeland. All of these wonderful photographs can be found in series A12111, the Immigration Photographic Archive. You can also find photographs by using the photo search function on record search. In Brisbane, we hold accommodation history cards from the Wakehall Migrant Accommodation Centre that include the name, nationality, age, details of arrival and family particulars of migrants. There is also a register of arrivals and departures from the Wakehall Centre, which can be used to track a migrant's movements to and from the centre. Otto Schweitzer and his wife, Margaret, built a 1,400 square feet home worth £5,000 in their spare time. Otto came to Australia as a carpenter with a German contracting company, planned to make some quick money and return to marry Margaret. But he liked it so much here that he asked her to join him and they were married two weeks later in Brisbane. In this photograph, Mr Schweitzer polishes the honour roll of the Brisbane German Gymnastics Club from 1907 and pulls a beer at the German club in Brisbane. And here's a close-up of that honour roll. The number of German-born migrants to Australia has dropped off over the years, starting in the 1960s as the German economy grew. In 1954, Germans were the third most common migrant. In 2001, they were the seventh. And as of the 2016 census, they no longer appear in the top 10. But as of 2016, German is the fifth largest ancestral group in Queensland, with almost 300,000 respondents claiming German ancestry, as well as the largest non-English speaking group. There is a German saying, Alla Anfung ist schwer. All beginnings are hard. Leaving behind their homeland and all they know to begin an uncharted life is an experience unique to migrants. If there's one thing that German migrants brought with them to Australia, it was the qualities of strength and perseverance. You can access our research support service by submitting an online question. We provide basic reference work for free and aim to respond to your question within 30 business days. Simply go to our website and under the tab to help with your research, select Ask Us About the Collection. Scroll down until you see the heading question types and select the category most relevant to your research. It's best to include as much detail about your question as possible. This will help the reference officer managing your query to complete a thorough search of our collections and finding aids. Well, that's it from me. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation on German family history research at the National Archives of Australia. Our research centre is open to the public Wednesday to Friday between 9 and 4.30. You can contact us via the phone number on the screen and speak directly to one of our reference officers if you have any questions. But I'm here now, so you can ask me some questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, so I do see a a question from Sharon Willis. When searching in NAA, will the search recognise the umlaut or should it not be used? I don't think it does recognise the umlaut. So just type in any search terms without it. Um, as we get more sophisticated, that might be something in the future that is allowed. Another question from Angela. When researching German ancestors, is it useful to learn some German terms? Um, yes, it can be, but in really because we've got records about individuals, 
uh, their names uh, and their history is more important. So if you know that they were interned or went to an, a migrant accommodation camp, you would be searching those types of records. So the good news, I guess, is that you don't really need to have German terms under your belt, but definitely go to that immigration and citizenship link and that will be able to give you maybe a bit more of a background um, as to why people were interned or, for example, where they might have gone, how they were uh, travelling to Australia. So that's a good general background information to, uh, to acquire. Um, so, Chris, uh, not all German men were interned, but certainly they tried to get a lot of them interned. Interestingly, women and children were not, of course, allowed to be interned. Um, but it is interesting, as I mentioned in the talk, how people that were naturalised as British citizens, because at this time Australian citizenship wasn't really a concept, it's interesting that they are suddenly being referred to in wartime as German citizens again. So it's just really unfair that they wanted to brand people of German heritage and other aliens as not being citizens, even though they'd gone through some sort of process and then they could easily intern them. And I think that the population did support that in Australia, unfortunately. Um, I can make some speaker notes available. I can send them to uh, the hosts of this webinar. So certainly, yes, so you can have a look at some of the series that aren't on the slides. And there's another one from Diane. My German ancestors arrived in 1885. Are there any records of family sponsorships who had previously arrived? Perhaps not that early for us. Uh, maybe the state archives, the Queensland State Archives, but maybe later, so certainly Post-World War II, there are a lot more sponsorship records. And um, do I have time for one more? How do I find ships that went to Rockhampton? What you can do is you can either send us and ask us about the collection question or I can, we've got fact sheets as well on the website that show you which passenger records are held in Brisbane, um, or you could just type in on Google NAA passenger records Brisbane. But what I do know is that ships that came into Rockhampton, we have those from 1898 to 1962. I might quickly show you how to do that by sharing the screen. We have fact sheets. You search in here and type in fact sheets. And click on the first link. You might want to do a little control F to find passenger records. And we have passenger records held in Canberra, Perth, Sydney, Melbourne, and here's Brisbane, which is likely where they would be because they've come into Rockhampton. And so this is a list of inward passenger lists for the different regions and there's Rockhampton there. And it gives you the series number, J727, and then you can search that series in our advanced search as we were looking at previously. So I might leave that there so that the next, um, the next presenter can do their presentation. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Even for comparative newcomers to family history research, it soon becomes clear that the spelling, or more precisely the misspelling of names, can have a major impact on the success of your research. This is particularly true when researching immigrants from non-English speaking parts of the world. 
This morning, our focus is on German immigrants coming to Queensland in the 19th century. You do not need to speak German to retrieve information on German migrants from Australian records. However, an understanding of some of the common problems you may face can assist your research. Our aim this morning is for you to know something about the historical factors affecting German family history research, why names were recorded inconsistently, some characteristics of the German language and old German script that can assist research for your German ancestors, search strategies and techniques to find information in Australian records, where to go for additional support. We should then be looking at examples of how awareness of these issues can improve our research results. Firstly, we should define exactly what we mean when we say our ancestor came from Prussia or Germany. Who were the Germans? Before 1800, the area of Europe we're talking about had been impacted by centuries of conflict between numerous small kingdoms, principalities, duchies and independent city-states. This had weakened them and made them vulnerable to attack from neighbouring countries. Later centuries saw the area further impacted by such major events as the Napoleonic Wars, the First and Second World Wars, and the reunification of Germany. These conflicts and the treaties that ended them resulted in the constant redrawing of borders. Thus the map of Europe and that of Germany has been one of constantly changing boundaries. What does this mean for us as family history researchers? Well, the implications for German family history research are that there's no central recording agency. There are different dates for commencement of civil registration of births, deaths and marriages and other records. There will be different details in the records. There's often no consistently used language in the records. And you may need to deal with frequent place name changes. When an area was taken over by a non-German speaking nation, there would be a change in the language used in official records and corresponding changes in local place names. To illustrate what I mean, we're going to look at the history of Schleswig-Holstein in the far northwest of Germany. We start off in the 12th century with two distinct duchies. One Danish, Schleswig, that's the red and orange areas on the map, and the other one German, Holstein, the yellow area. By 1773, after a Danish victory, both duchies had become Danish. Almost a hundred years later, in 1864, Denmark lost both duchies. Nord Schleswig, the red portion on the map, became Prussian, and South Schleswig, the orange section, fell to Austria. Just three years later, in 1867, after the Austro-Prussian War, the duchies were combined to form the Prussian province of Schleswig-Holstein. It wasn't until 1920 that a plebiscite was held to determine which country the population wanted to be part of. Nord Schleswig voted to become part of Denmark. South Schleswig and Holstein combined to become the German state Schleswig-Holstein. So here we have an area where the population spoke maybe different details at different periods of time. And perhaps most significantly, surviving census or civil registration records might be held locally in a regional archive, in central archives in Denmark, elsewhere in Germany, or even Austria. To further complicate our family history research in this area, we may also need to deal with issues such as the Danish patronymic naming system, where Per Andersen's son might be called Lars Peterson. So where to start? It's critical to establish first the place of origin and an approximate date of arrival in Australia. 
we exhaust Australian resources first, simply because they're easier to access. We can look for information on places of origin in family papers, birth, death and marriage certificates, church records, immigration records and German emigration records, naturalization records, newspapers, old maps and online gazetteers. Here's a great example of how newspapers can aid our research. This image was taken at the 1914 reunion of German pioneers who had arrived aboard the Susanna Godfroy uh, in 1865. Each pioneer clearly identified in the photo. Of course, in the time we have here today, it's not possible to cover in depth all of the resources I've just mentioned. However, you will find information on each of them in the State Library's Family History Research Guides on the State Library's website. The links to the guides are shown along the top of the screen here. You can view them online or download them as PDF documents. We look at the resources for German immigrants to Queensland. The main source of immigration information on Germans coming to Queensland in the 19th century is, of course, the official records of Queensland assisted immigrants, 1848 to 1912, that are held at Queensland State Archives. Details provided on the immigrants vary, but are often quite limited. Most importantly, there's no wildcard option in searching the indexes, nor can truncated names be successfully used in searches. You need to know the exact spelling of given and family names as they were recorded for su successful search results. If your ancestor arrived before 1859, when Queensland became a state, you may find them in New South Wales list of assisted immigrants to Moreton Bay. There's often excellent detail in these records, especially in the immigration board lists. While there are no official lists of unassisted arrivals to Queensland, there are various resources available to help trace ship names and dates. However, they usually contain only minimal information on individual migrants. The closest we have in Queensland to official records of unassisted immigrants are the Queensland Custom House list of passengers and crew. The original lists are held at State Archives of Australia. As with most records of unassisted arrivals, details provided are minimal. Often only a surname is recorded. They're searchable online at the National Archives of Australia, but you need to have a fairly good idea of the date of arrival before you start. The records between 1852 and 1899 have been indexed by Queensland Family History Society and made available in an electronic version on CD-ROM that provides for flexible and wildcard search options. Another source for information on unassisted immigrants are shipping intelligence reports in newspapers, although usually only passengers in first or saloon class are named, again often by surname only. We need also checklists of unassisted arrivals in other states. Although the final destination of our immigrant ancestors may have been Queensland, their details may have been recorded in another state if that was where their first port of call was. Finally, we have a selection of German emigration records that may help us. German emigration records are a very useful additional resource for our research. There are two types. First, based on applications to emigrate. It was quite common for German states to require their citizens to apply for permission to emigrate. A fairly well-known example is the Württemberg list, dating from the late 1700s to 1900. These records do not include dates of voyages or ship names. They mostly cover departures to the US and not all those listed actually migrated. The second type of emigration lists are original lists of departures from German ports. Lists survived for Bremen, 1920 to 1939, 
Earlier lists were either discarded as no longer needed or destroyed during World War II bombing. And the Hamburg list from 1850 to 1934. Again, there are two types of lists. The first one for immigrants traveling direct to their end destination. The second for those intending to disembark at another port, such as London or Naples, before embarking on another vessel to their final destination, i.e. the indirect lists. Both types of lists are accessible via Ancestry.com, but the German handwritten records are difficult to search. Uh, you can check the State Library Research Guide, German Immigrants and Immigration, for further details. Fortunately for us, Eric and Rosemary Kapitke have meticulously transcribed the records of emigrants from Hamburg to Australia from 1850 to 1879 and provided an excellent resource for information on German emigrants coming to Australia and New Zealand in this period. They're available in printed book format and on CD-ROM. They offer a number of flexible search options and include useful glossaries of occupations, translated from the German, some interpretation of German place names, and shipping intelligence reports for each vessel. Sometimes more passengers are shown on departure lists than on the Australian arrival lists. So we need always verify that the passenger actually arrived in Australia. The electronic options on CD-ROM offer simple multiple flexible searching possibilities. And you can use truncation, wildcard, and simplest selections at first. The Kapitki indexes are a very useful source of information for Australian and New Zealand family history researchers, and we should be looking later at examples of how they can be used effectively. German names can be found in numerous variant forms in Australian records. There are a number of reasons. With personal names, Germans were often keen to be assimilated into their new homeland and may have deliberately anglicized their given and or family names. Thus, Gärtner may have become Gardner, Muller may have become Miller, Johann became John, and so on. We should remember too that in Australia in later decades, it was not always desirable to be of German descent, for example, during World War I. Many German families, sometimes after years in the state, deliberately anglicized their names during this period. Names may have been incorrectly recorded because the clerk recording them did not understand German. He recorded what he heard. Transcribers of records may have had trouble deciphering names written in an unfamiliar script and transcribed them inaccurately. When we come to places of origin, they're frequently almost illegible in original documents. And the names may no longer exist. You may not be able to find them in modern day maps. And we have incorrectly remembered details, such as ships, names, and dates of arrival passed down through the family by word of mouth. They may be incorrect, incorrectly remembered. An example is the vessel La Rochelle, which may be remembered as Laura Shell. And this can take some unraveling. We need to treat all unverified information with caution until we can verify it. Pronunciation is a source of frequent misspelling of German names in Australian records. If we understand some of the characteristics of German pronunciation, it can help us. The umlaut on vowels, the two little dots above the vowel, elongate the sound of the vowel. However, it is often overlooked by non-German speakers. The convention for German speakers in printed text is to replace the two dots, the umlaut, with an E after the vowel to indicate that the vowel sound is elongated. When we come to a name like Müller, it may be recorded as Miller, which is an anglicized version, Muller with the umlaut, umlaut ignored, Müller with the umlaut correctly transcribed as OE, or Muller, what it sounded like. 
The German letter E sounds the same in German as the English A. Name like Anders may be recorded as Anders. At the end of words, E is always sounded. To the English speaker, the two names on the screen are distinctly different, Katharina and Catherine. However, for a German, both names would be pronounced as Katharina. The German single S sounds like the English Z, so the German Elizabeth is pronounced as Elizabeth. Pronunciation of the German CH depends on its position in the word. For example, Eichmann as opposed to Schumann. It's often incorrectly recorded as the K sound. There are lots of other more familiar characteristics of the spoken German language, such as the W sounding like a V and the V sounding like an F. And they can all affect the spelling and the filing order of names. German script is another source of misspellings. Old German current script was taught in schools up to 1941 and is what most of our German ancestors would have been taught. Many modern day Germans are unable to read the old German script. This chart from Family Search is one of many available in print and on the internet to assist in deciphering what is written. I'd like you now to look more closely at the chart so that you can see what it is that causes so much confusion and frustration for researchers. For example, compare the uppercase letters B, C and L. They all look very similar. Imagine how difficult it must be to work out the spelling of an unfamiliar place name without being able to clearly distinguish between these and other letters. Now look at the lowercase h and the lowercase s. Both look more like an f to our eyes. See also the three different characters we have for s. There's an uppercase, a middle of the word the and there are websites offering help with deciphering old German handwriting, but it is still very much a case of solving complex puzzles. It is small wonder that non-German speaking indexes often transcribe German names inaccurately. The example I have here on the left is the word November, which is spelled exactly the same in German and in English. You can see that it's a little challenging, even with the letters all separated. Imagine how much more confusing it might be with the letters joined up in normal handwriting. Records written in current script can cause major confusion, particularly in relation to place names. Now we're going to see how we can apply what we've learned to find the immigration details for Adeline Musk. So we start off with what we know about Adeline. From Queens and Indexes of Birthdays and Marriages, we know that she married Henry Herman Viner in 1875. Her given name is variously written with an E or an A at the end, which is what we'd understand with the German pronunciation. Her married name, Viner, has sometimes been wrongly recorded as Werner. Wherever her maiden name is found in the records, it's usually recorded as M-A-S-Q-U-E, as in the uh, father's name on her death record. However, her son's death record, on the lower left here, suggests that it might not be altogether straightforward and that the final E in the name was probably sounded out. Now let us try to see what we know about German language and pronunciation as applied to the name. The Adeline given name ends with an E and we know that in German this is usually sounded out. So we should, we should be looking for a possible name variant ending in A, Adelina. The single S in German sounds like the English Z. The combination of the letters QU is not common in German, but not impossible. 
Germans would normally sound out the final E, so the name might sound something like Adelina Maska. We found no record under the name Mask in Australian immigration records. We know Adelina arrived before 1875 when she married and that she was reportedly German. We can look to the electronic version of the Kapitki indexes to see if we can find her. Remembering the CD-ROM will give us maximum flexibility in searching. It's a fairly unusual name, Adelina, that could be spelled any with an E or an A, so we could have used a wild card to cover both possibilities. Here we've just used it straight, Adelina, in the German way. To cover the possibility that Adelina was a second name, we could also have extended the search parameter to a whole of field if necessary. We're just searching by her given name. And here she is, Adelina Matzke. The name very close in sound to what we'd worked out for, from Mask. The record tells us that she was lady that is single, and aged 26 in 1873, traveling aboard the Eugenie bound for Queensland. Her place of origin was Le Pauvre in Pommel. You have to excuse my pronunciation on that. Of course, this only shows that Adelina embarked on the ship at Hamburg. We need to make sure that she actually arrived in Queensland. Checking the Queensland State Archives Assisted Immigration Indexes, we find verification that Adelina arrived in Queensland in 1873. Her name is spelled correctly in the index. We just didn't know before what that spelling was. The next step might be to purchase a copy of either the marriage or death certificate. The former, where the bride would have provided the information, should confirm both her age and place of origin. As we've seen with Schleswig-Holstein, German land boundaries have changed dramatically over the centuries. Parts of Pomerania have at various periods come under Polish, Prussian, Russian or Swedish control. With the new information we have about Adelina Matzke, for example, we need to establish whether Lupov still exists today and if not, where is it located and what is its current name? The online database Kartenmeister is not the only resource for this sort of information, but it is a very useful starting point when looking for changes of place names in areas east of the Oder and Nysa rivers. Details are based on the spring 1918 borders. We can search by the German name, an older German name, the Kreis or county, by the next larger town, and the present day Polish, Russian or Lithuanian name, and even by the family name. The database includes wildcard options and helpful hints on how name spellings may have changed. Here we find that Lupov is now part of Northern Poland and its modern name is Lupawa in the county of Stolp. And the geographical coordinates are provided its exact location. There's also a link to Google Maps. We now have enough information to start looking for the location of relevant family history records. We may locate some records in databases such as Ancestry.com, but the Latter-day Saints Family Search Catalog details millions of record sets from across the world and is a good place to start. And here we see that in the catalogue they have um, entries under both the old German name, Lupov in Pomerne, and under the Polish name Lupawa in Kotzalin. And again, you have to um, excuse my pronunciation. Um, they have parish uh, records from 1734 to 1870. Uh, so they should cover, hopefully, um, details of Adelina's birth. As we find out more about the history of Lupol, additional options for further research may become evident. 
As mentioned earlier, shipping records are not the only source of immigration information. Naturalization records and newspaper reports of special anniversaries and obituaries can be major supplementary sources. In this case, we're using an obituary to look for details. We note the German spelling of the given name, Elizabeth, with an S instead of a Z. We have her place and date of birth. Elizabeth's maiden name, Bircher, is spelled in the conventional German way with the O-E indicating that it's spelled with an O umlaut. We know that, um, but we can be alert to the fact that the name may be recorded with a simple O in Australian indexes if the umlaut was ignored. The obituary states clearly the name of the ship was Morialty and the date of arrival was 1882. Before we can accept this information, of course, we have to look for verification in official records. Not surprisingly, perhaps, we find the Bircher family listed under the name Botcher in Queensland Assisted Immigration Indexes. However, the family are recorded arriving aboard the British Consul in 1882. How can the family have got it so wrong? Which is correct, the Moriarty or the British Consul? Strictly speaking, neither is correct. Further research reveals a newspaper article about the name of the British Consul being changed to Morialta. In line with the precept that we should always look for verification in another source, we check Lloyd's Register of Shipping 1883 to 1884 and find a record of the change of ship name to Morialta. I see down the bottom there it says, late British consul. The Bircher family's arrival was recorded under the previous name of the ship. We're now going to be looking for the arrival of uh, the ancestors of Alexander Gustav Brisky and their first arrival in Queensland. This is what we know. The memorial stone, death registration and electoral roll all show the same spelling of the surname Brisky, B-R-I-S-K-I-E. The only apparent name variation is in the memorial stone where the name Gustav has been spelled in the English way with an E added. However, we note the names of his parents, particularly the mother, Maria, with an A, Zuchum. We first start looking at the Queensland Registry's online birth, deaths and marriage indexes to see if we can find any variant spellings relating to Alexander Gustav Brisky. The use of truncation and wild cards can help widen our search. Gustav Alexander Brisky was born in Queensland. We note the only variation in the spelling of the surname is in the birth record, B-R-I-S-K-E-Y. However, we also note here that the spelling of the name Gustav has been anglicised with the addition of an E. Perhaps Brisky was an early attempt to anglicise the surname. We also notice the variant spelling of the mother's maiden name, Suhom, not Suhum. Things get more complicated when we research the next generation back, Gustav, sorry, Alexander Gustav's parents. This is the first introduction of Briska and Friska with an E as additional variants of the name. Note Maria with the E, not the A at the end. Locating death details from Maria Briski would be almost impossible if you could not use truncation and wildcard options in your search. The father's name, Zuchom, tells us that this is the right Maria. There are also three variants of the name associated with death records for Alexander Gustav's father. The death record is B-R-I-S-K-E-Y, and we have the newspaper notice that Gustav Martin Briske, B-R-I-S-K-E, was also known as Gustav Martin Briske, B-R-I-S-K-I-E.
Using truncation and wildcard in the Queensland Registry's historical indexes, we search for names beginning with BRISK, B-R-I-S-K, with which most of the variants seem to occur. This gives us results with four variants of the name Brisky, including a formerly unknown one, Briska, ending in an A. We find new variants of the name Zucha, too, in the birth records for Alexander Gustav's siblings. We also note new variants in the mother's given name. She's Mary, Maria with an E and Maria with an A. The earliest event we can locate in the birth, death and marriage indexes is the March 1880 birth of Alexander Gustav's sister, Minna Matilda Briska. Now is when we turn our attention to finding out when the family came to Queensland sometime before that date. We cannot find the immigration details in Queensland Assisted Immigration Indexes, even though we search using all the variants we now have of the name Brisky. Therefore, we go again to the CD-ROM version of the Kapitki Indexes to image of the family name BRIS. If this does not produce a result, we may widen our search to include other possible variants. And of course, we hope, they travelled by Hamburg. At the bottom of the screen, you can see the results of our search. Here we have the full record of Alexander Gustav Briski's father, Gustav, at age nine, arriving with his parents and siblings aboard the Reichstag in 1875. Their native place is Chotschau in Pommel. If you check the ages of the children against the age of the Maria Briska, described as Frau or wife, it's evident that this is a second marriage for the father. Once again, this only records the family at Hamburg. We need to check that they actually arrived in Queensland. Now we know the name of the ship aboard which the family arrived, we can return to the Queensland State Archives Assisted Immigration Indexes and search again using just the name of the ship, Reichstag, and one of the family's given name, Gustav, in this, uh, this instance. This allows us to see that the family had been recorded under yet another previously unknown variant of the name, surname Brischke, with an I on the end. So what does this tell us about the search strategies we need to employ? When beginning your research of your German emigrant ancestor, it's important to be aware firstly of German conventions of script, language and adaptation that can affect spelling of names and places. And to be aware also that names of people and places can have multiple variants. Because German names can appear in so many variants, it's wise wherever possible, to use databases and indexes that provide flexible search options. Use the following when appropriate and possible. Wildcards to overcome spelling or transcription errors. A search by given name. Other sources of immigration details such as naturalizations, obituaries and significant anniversaries noted in newspapers. The more variants of the name you can identify, the better able you will be to retrieve information from resources with less flexible search options. If you need more help, our team is happy to help you. You can contact us by our phone or chat services from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, or via our Ask Us Inquiry service, which you'll find on the State Library's website. Questions. I'm here now to answer some questions. Um, Diane says that her grandfather was naturalised in Western Australia and can I access his naturalisation application? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head the answer to that. Usually the application uh, forms are not um, sort of kept um, and it depends like in Queensland here we only have the oaths of allegiance which don't give you an awful lot of information I'd suggest that you look at our, our family history research guide on naturalization for where to find Western Australian records and go from there 
Um, we have many German ancestors and um, Tusk um, who arrived in Queens between 1855 and 1880. None of them was interned. Why would this? Why would that be? They were all farmers. Um, it's really hard to answer a question like that. It might have been that uh, they didn't have jealous neighbours. Um, they cooperated as a community. Um, it's almost impossible to say, um, but it's good news for them, that's for sure, because a lot of um, Germans did suffer a lot of discrimination and hardship in that time. Uh, that leads into um, the second, another question from Suzanne. Would Australia-born Aust Germans be investigated in World War I or would it only be people reported on? If so, where would they be? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by where would they be. Um, Germans had to uh, report as enemy aliens to local police stations and there would be records there, um, but not all of them would have been investigated unless someone reported them. It might have been a jealous neighbour or it might have been something that they thought was a bit suspicious that needed investigating. Um, and records of that would, I imagine, be at National Archives. Uh, for Germans, um, from Gail uh, Neumann, for Germans who were aliens in World War I and no longer able to own a business, could they work for someone else? And if not, did they receive financial support? I don't believe they received financial support, and that's where one of the uh, major hardships of um, being interned or being an enemy alien occurred. Um, there's a, a story, or, or many stories actually, of workers in Queensland who had a German sounding name and tried to change it in order to get employment. Um, and they were fined or possibly jailed if that was found out. So it was a really hard time for them. Um, are there any coastal shipping records of passenger movements 1862 to 1864, uh, for example, from Hobart to Morton Bay, asked Jenny. Um, the family relocated from Hobart to Rosewood Scrub. That's one of those things that you might be able to put in through um, our Ask Us service so we can be uh, quite specific about which family we're looking for. Um, coastal shipping records tend to be a bit hit and miss and they don't have full names often, but it's um, a query that we could take as an Ask Us inquiry. Um, Chris loves the fact that I'm using the Brisky family. Um, and it's not his ancestor, but um, I'm glad. I hope it helps you. I think that we found something like eight or nine variants of the name. I'm not sure that we found them all even then. So I hope it helps you. Okay, and the last question from Angela is, would they intern the entire family or just the men? It's basically the men who are interned. Um, I think they didn't see the women and children um, as a threat. So, yeah, basically the men. But again, the records at National Archives will give you more detail on that. I've got time for one more question. Okay, okay um, Margaret wants to know, is there any inf information about families already in 1860 here sponsoring other family members? Not in the official records, it would be in uh, family documents only. Um, the records of sponsorship don't go back that far, unfortunately. One last one. Mary, some passengers lists show some names followed by a number of Germans. How can I find out those names? That is the, the tricky bit. Um, it's only going to be through something like um, a, an obituary or an anniversary where the ship is named that you're going to find those names. I've come across records where they'll say, you know, we've got Herr Schmidt and um, three Schmidt children and a wife, a servant and 15 foreigners, and that's all you have. So it's almost impossible to locate accurate shipping records for everybody, um, and that's why we have to use um, a whole variety of different resources. And Annette Brown says, can Prussian records from 1870s within German regional archives be accessed by our state library? Wouldn't that be nice? But no, you do actually you often have to travel to those archives or uh, contact them directly if you um, know of specific records that you need to access. Um, that's it, I'm afraid. That's all we have time for today. But if you need any more help, you know, uh, contact us via the phone, chat service or ask us. Thank you for tuning in.